Hey team, welcome back to another episode of the Strength Game Podcast. I'm your host, Nick O'Brien, and this is episode number 88. The Strength Game is a weekly podcast dedicated to discussing all things physical culture with the coaches, athletes, iron enthusiasts, and experts deeply embedded in the strength game on both sides of the profession, both as coaches and as competitive athletes. I want to thank everyone who has liked, shared, and commented Anyone that's given us any sort of rating or review, your support allows us to continue to bring on expert guests and highlight more individuals in the strength game, just like our guests today. I also want to thank our sponsors. Samson Equipment provides first-class weight rooms and has earned an exceptional reputation of providing the finest quality design and customer service. Being a direct manufacturer, the team at Samson brings full customization capabilities and not only branding, but in custom equipment needed to execute your next project. From racks, plates, barbells, dumbbells, benches, flooring, storage, and much more, Samson equipment is durable and made to order from premium grade materials, all built from scratch, start to finish. Samson equipment provides professional weight room solutions for all your strength and conditioning needs. See the Samson standard for yourself and learn more at samsonequipment.com. Also want to thank our sponsor, Cerberus Strength. If you're in the market for the highest quality strength and conditioning gear and equipment, be sure to use promo code strength underscore game at checkout to receive 10% off your next order at CerberusStrength.com. And in this week's episode, I am joined by Will Rattel. Will is an assistant strength and conditioning coach at the University of North Dakota, working with the volleyball and softball programs, along with providing assistance to the football team. Rattel returned to his alma mater, UND, as a full-time coach in 2018, after previously serving as an intern in the department from 2015 to 2017. In addition to his collegiate coaching experience, Rattel is the owner of W2 Performance. W2 Performance is an online training program that provides athletes a service to aid in them taking their sports performance to a higher level, as well as provides consulting for sports teams and individuals. He's written multiple articles for Simply Faster and has been featured on many other coaching and performance-based podcasts. Prior to working in the performance field, he spent time as a professional football player with the Atlanta Falcons, Kansas City Chiefs, and Saskatchewan Rough Riders of the CFL. Rattel was a four-year linebacker on the University of North Dakota football team, picking up multiple accolades during his career, including holding the UND single-season records for tackles. Following his football career, Rattel remains a highly dedicated strength and power athlete. I'm excited to have him on the show today. So with all that said, let's get in the game with Coach Will Rattel. What's going on, everybody? I'm excited today. I have Coach Rattel on the podcast. What's going on today, Will? Not a whole lot, man. Just kind of hanging out here. I know, man. We're enjoying the summer a little bit before uh, before your teams and uh, and all the athletes start showing up for the fall. So I'm glad we got to circle back around and get you on today. So uh, without any further ado, like really want to get started on what got you started in the strength game. I know you played a lot of football growing up, but what else was kind of sprinkled in and leading you into what you're doing nowadays? Yeah, I just like training ever since I started it. Um, going back to like high school, um, when I didn't know what I was doing and I was doing cleans for sets of 12, um, uh, I just always liked training. And then I went to college and obviously I was playing football in college. And so like we had mandatory training sessions, lifting, running, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, one day it just kind of hit me that like we had a strength coach and I didn't, I never really thought that that was a profession until it just kind of like hit me that I was at a training session with my team. And we had like a head strength coach with some assistants. I was like, oh shit, this is actually a real job. And then, so from then I was just kind of like, I kind of want to do this. And so I went, uh, got my uh, degree in kinesiology with uh, the plan to be a strength coach. And that's kind of where, where I'm at now. Yeah. Cause between that time you, you took a, you took a leap and tried to take football for a little bit of a ride. I know um, transitioning out of that, like, what was that experience like 
like going from college and then playing with some of those professional guys in both the NFL and CFL. And then what was that leap? Did your training change at all? Or like, what was your mindset going into that? Uh, no, my training never really changed. I just kind of kept doing the same stuff I learned in college. Um, and it's actually kind of, kind of funny why, that you asked why, like if it changed or not, because at the time I was very, uh, like stuck in my ways. I obviously learned from, from Bockel, who was my strength coach. He's now my boss here, but I learned like his way of doing things. And I thought that was like the right way, the only way to do it. Um, and then you get into like the NFL and CFL and you see things are a lot different, a lot less like heavy lifting, a lot less like axial loading, those kinds of things, which I thought was really important. And then like, I started getting into coaching after my playing career was done. And then I was, I started to see like the value in the way things were done at the professional level. And now actually in hindsight, I kind of think that the way I was doing it in college is probably the better way because it's like, you're training hard. Um, you're not trying to get super cute with your training. It's just go lift heavy, go sprint, go jump. Um, and now that's the way I, that's what I value now, which in like the NFL and CFL, they value more so like the technology stuff and like, uh, restorative sessions, those kinds of things, which I think are just kind of bullshit most of the time. Uh, but there was like a time where I did have that shift eventually. And now I've shifted back to like what I thought was right in college. And now I, I think that's correct again in a lot of ways. So Right. Yeah. There's a, there's a time and a place for some of those things, but I don't know why either organizations or teams or maybe levels, people get so fixated on one thing and it's got to be this, like, I feel like you could pull from all those situations. You could still be simplistic and lift with the barbell and you still can train heavy and actual load. And you could still add some of those recovery modalities in there too. Like you don't, there, there's no one to say that you have to pick a side. You can do what best fits your team and your athletes. And especially at the professional level, I would see, I, I can't imagine why you would just blankets every single athlete comes in. Like you do it this way. The people, people got to be pretty upset about that because if you enjoy training and that's, if you, for yourself, like that's what gave you confidence and success in college. Like, why wouldn't you continue that pursuit? Like, why would you throw that all away? If that's what makes you drive to get better and what you feel like is going to be the ultimate way for you to get on the field. Yeah. Well, I think it's kind of funny how there's always like this argument, um, that's, that comes from like the anti lift heavy or anti Olympic lift crowd that like those sorts of things aren't what gets you to the next level, which is like, it's kind of a meaningless term because no one makes that argument, but that doesn't like discredit the merit of those uh, training methods. Like, you know what I mean? Like, of course, being a good Olympic lifter didn't help me get to uh, like my pro career, but like it didn't hurt. And it's still a good uh, efficacy, efficacy, training method to use and i don't know i like i fell into this trap of like i hear things that like max schmarzo would say about you know you follow max schmarzo yeah. right like he has so many low iq takes now but like i believe in it uh i started to believe in a lot of things he said of like you don't need a squat full depth uh to be to be a good athlete which is of course no one says you have to but you still should you don't have to olympic lift it's like no shit you don't have to but you still probably should like all these different uh like slogans and then there's this fallacy of, well, we have these really high level athletes who don't do all these training methods. Therefore, these training methods shouldn't be done to become a high level athlete. It's like, well, you're not a high level athlete. So maybe you should use these training methods because it's good, effective training. And you're regardless of what you do, you're not going to be a high level athlete. There's still like good training methods. Does that make sense? I don't know if I made yeah. any sense right there, if that was like articulate or not, but uh yeah. No, it makes sense. There's a lot of those kind of catchy, grabby slogans that people always try to do. If this, this, like, oh, the five things you must be doing if you're this kind of athlete, like never do this. It's it's all, I don't know why, but it, it grabs attention for everybody. And it's shitty that that's what a lot of the profession has ended up doing. And even some of the coaches that are in either collegiate setting or like pro setting, a lot of them have fallen victim to that thing too, because they know that's what's going to either going to be 
on social media platforms that their athletes are going to see and they're invariably going to ask those questions and they're going to want to ask why we're not doing that in our training if this expert is saying this but yeah it's there's causation and correlation like that's that's the big thing in the profession like just Mm -hmm. because just because you've got a group of olympic lifters and invariably their verts are great like is olympic lifting causing their vert to be great or just because they're actually like good athletes their vert was great anyway Mm -hmm. like yeah uh that's a that's a long tangent that we could go on forever so i mean with your own training nowadays like it was a little bit different when you were getting ready for football like obviously you're either getting competitive for saturday you're trying to prep and get ready for a sunday whatever your game day is going to be how do you kind of keep your own training engaging and competitive nowadays um i know you're always you're constant on on social media like you post a lot of stuff of yourself lifting but like invariably, like you got to find a way for you to stay engaged and get on the platform, or is that just come natural for you? Yeah, I mean, it comes natural for sure because I enjoy it. But as far as like keeping it engaging, I just come up with more and new shit all the time. So like, uh, like I just started this Olympic weightlifting tricks competition on Instagram, and I've got some pretty pretty cool submissions so far. But anyways, like um, to make that engaging, I like doing the Olympic lifts. I like cleaning, jerking, snatching. But it gets boring. Like I don't, I don't just want to clean a jerk all the time. So I come up with new ways to do it. Um, so I did like a bazooka clean, um, or like there's just a lot of different ways you can come up and be creative with to make sure that stuff stays engaging for you. And like a zercher clean, catch it in a zercher position, or like uh, you do like a knee jump with a bar on your back into a into a split jerk. Just like find ways to make it harder and more challenging and to progress within the movement. Um, yeah, and just keep expanding your like motor development abilities. I guess that's yeah. how I keep it engaging. Just come up with new shit to do. As long as you're like confident with it, and you can hit all these like certain positions, you have the like requisite range of motion to get in certain positions, and you um, like the load ability uh, is appropriate for you. It's all good stuff to do. So, yeah, really just keep lifting and try to find more fun, challenging ways to do things to make it more fun yeah no i like it it's a uh, it's definitely like testing your athleticism and it's keeping you it's keeping stuff fun like training should be fun especially if if you're like me you're training alone most of the time so yeah if, i am usually i am yeah exactly so you got to find ways to keep it interesting i saw the uh i saw the olympic uh the clean to a zercher and i was like i've done that not on purpose a lot of times yeah, yeah. with, with I my too. axle bars i was like Maybe maybe this could actually be a trick and I can learn how to catch it in that position and get it back up. I've that's that's how I used to do all my axle like continental cleans. I just started throwing up up and then shooting my arms under like a zombie. And I was like, oh, maybe this can actually work for now. So yeah. I might I might have to submit that one in to the podcast. Yeah, submit that shit. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's awesome, man. Um, but invariably you you've had a lot of training experience leading up to it, and that's a reason why you're kind of able to do all those things. Um, I know some people will probably get it twisted that like you went right into that, but you've got years of training experience underneath your belt and you're pretty damn strong. So there, there's a reason why you can make those things look pretty effortless and fun. But on top, on top of like all the training, and everything you do, we kind of talked a little bit off air before we got going, like you're, you're a college strength coach now, like at your alma mater, at University of North Dakota, working with teams and assisting with football and everything too. And then you've got like the Haas project and your and your side coaching. How do you kind of keep all that in check? Like you got family life at home, you've got coaching like at UND, your own stuff on the side and training. Like, well, like, is it a push pull balance? Like, is there ever kind of like a manageable kind of balance to this whole thing? Or how do you, how do you address that? Yeah, it's really easy, actually. Uh, so I'm married. I got a daughter on the way. Not not yet. Due in September. Um, but with my job on campus, like, I don't have that many responsibilities. I just kind of show up when I'm supposed to be there. If I don't have a responsibility on campus at a certain time, I just don't have to be there. So um, I go home. And if my wife is at work or, like, we have downtime, I work in my side business. And yeah, it's really easy. My, my life, honestly, my life is really soft. My life is really unstressful. So 
Um, yeah, it's super easy. Don't really have to manage much. I just, um, I kind of play the hand I'm dealt, take each day by day, hour by hour. And if I'm open and I'm, I'm free to do something, I find ways to be productive. If I have responsibilities, I take care of my responsibilities, whether it's at home or on campus. Pretty, It's pretty simple. Yeah, that works. That's uh, you make it sound so simple, but I I know a lot of people are like, there's no way this. It's hard to balance all those things. Like even starting, like you said, starting a side business. That's probably that had to have at least taken a little bit more effort on the front end, and now you're kind of yeah. reaping the rewards a little bit. Yeah, that took more effort because I was still trying to figure out like my own voice and the way I communicated certain messaging, and I think I was a lot dumber then. Um, like I'm a lot. I have a lot more knowledge now. I'm a lot wiser now, and I've kind of developed my own personality online, I guess, which is kind of like my lack of personality is my personality. <laughs> um, but yeah, back in like 2020, when I first started doing all the online stuff, that was I actually put effort into that. But now I just kind of like think of a thought or I see something on social media that I want to respond to, and I just make my own post on addressing that same topic that somebody else somebody else talked about, I just add my own, uh, my own take or own twist to it. And, um, I just like record my own training. So I record my training. If I have a video clip that like aligns with the specific topic I want to talk about, I throw it in there. It's pretty simple. And then with like the YouTube stuff, it's kind of the same thing. I just, well, I get a lot of questions on Instagram too. So that helps too. So people ask me a question and then I can just address that question with a social media post, which makes my job easier. So I'm not like, I'm not sitting at my desk trying to find ways to come up with original content to talk about. It just kind of just kind of comes. Um, so, yeah, it's it's easy, man. But like when you're yeah, when you're starting out, it's hard because you got to figure out ways to like catch eye, catch eyeballs, get an audience, grow the audience, be consistent with it. And then you don't want to like you don't want to rehash the same topic that other people are rehashing. And then if you end up rehashing those topics, you have to find a new way to talk about it that still is original and authentic. Um, like we don't need another post on like the five reasons why you should be taking creatine. Like I'm not going to post about that, but I'll post about other things that I think provides more value for people. So, yeah, no, I think that's great. No, it's it's nice when some of those questions already come into you. I know. I know that I've I've seen it myself, like where people seem like they're searching and they're they're just kind of sitting at their desk, like trying to figure out what content to create. But like, there's so many people that are asking those questions that like it should come naturally to you. Like if you put yourself in a position of a new lifter or someone that's looking at like the Olympic list for a first time, like what would those people ask? And it's it's nice when those people are like coming to you specifically, like as the expert, and be like, hey, how do you do this? And you're just kind of point shoot, like addressing the question, which makes it so much easier. Like, it's not that you're not putting a lot of thought into it. It's you're giving your quick response, like you're having a conversation. So it is authentic and original rather than like kind of rehearsed and just trying to follow those next like trends. And mm -hmm. I, I like that approach a lot better. Like obviously coming from a coach's lens because it's not something that's just trying to draw you in and it's unauthentic and it's kind of, it's just fucking dirty because everybody, everybody knows the game that everyone's playing when it comes to like social media and reels and all those different things. But to see someone just be able to give their knowledge and perspective raw, like unfiltered right away. Like, I think that's awesome. And that's how I'd want to have conversations with people the same way that you kind of put them up there. So that's cool. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so talking about like a little bit of your coaching voice and everything, how was that transition for you? Like it was a little bit removed, like you graduated, you were done playing football, and then you interned with Bockel for a few years. And I know you were at that time, I think you were still playing, like trying to go pro and play. Um, but from that time when you got your like hired on first full time, how did you kind of grow into your coaching voice? How did you kind of learn? the different side of the bar versus like being on the platform as a lifter and as like an athlete to now being the guy that has to coach up former teammates, former and now athletes on your own. Yeah. I really don't know. It just, just gets developed over time with experience, but I will say this. 
when I first started coaching, have you read the Brett Bartholomew book? Yeah, Conscious, Conscious coaching? coaching. Yeah. Yeah. I tried to follow that approach of like, not treat everybody differently, but try to understand everyone's perspective and try to um, use a different approach to address the same problem, but with a different person, use a different approach. Like uh, That shit just doesn't work. So, and you're trying to like pander diff to different coaches and athletes and assistant coaches and ATs. And I think I just got caught up in trying to be the one that is willing to work with everybody. Um, but that sucks because then you just compromise your own values and principles. So like now I just have my opinion and I state it and I don't really care anymore. And maybe that's a good thing for some, maybe like people like working with me for that reason. Maybe some people don't, but um, I'm done like compromising on a lot of things on campus. And it makes, makes my life simpler because uh, no one tries to No, I, I'm no no longer giving an inch and then someone taking a mile from me. So it makes my job simpler. Um, if I could give advice to anybody, it would be like uh, standard ground on anything that you believe in because regarding training, obviously, uh, because if you try to be the person that takes that Brett Bartholomew coach uh, style, that Brett Bartholomew approach, uh, you're going to end up in a bad place. Dude. You're going to get pushed around. You're going to get walked all over like that. It sounds good in theory, that book. But in practice, it doesn't it doesn't work, it just doesn't work. So um, how I've developed where I'm at, I don't know, just gaining confidence and having having experience, uh, reading a lot of different things, talking to a lot of different people, developing my own my own uh, approach and methods and systems, and models and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's how I've come to it. No, I like it. No, it's a it's a great advice for anybody because I feel like a lot of people in the profession have got pushed around because they're either confirming Terrible. what a head coach wants, what, what a sport conch, what, what an administrator wants, what their boss wants. It kind of right. became popular to have the, like the, it, there became a popular narrative among strength and conditioning coaches that uh, sport coaches and ATs view us as meatheads. Therefore we need to change our communication style to prove that we're not just uh, single-minded meatheads and it's our job to reach across the aisle to other people and enter their domains and um, demonstrate that we're willing to work with people in other domains. You know what I mean? Yeah. And we kind of overcorrected that, too. The premise of the, the premise of that is not true. And now based on a faulty premise, a, a ton of strength and conditioning coaches started trying to demonstrate that they are willing to work with other people in other fields and change their um, change their minds about things. And then now it's really, I think it's set the profession back. Like that's, I think that's part of the reason why we are so underpaid is because uh, we become less valuable if we are willing to compromise our positions on so many things. And we're willing to adjust our schedules because a coach has, um, has wants to go play golf on a Friday afternoon. So he's going to change a lift to change. You know what I mean? Like things like that. Like, no, don't do that because then that makes you look bad. So no, that's a great point. Being open-minded, like this whole idea of you should be open-minded. Like that's an ends. Like that's not an ends. You know what I mean? Being open-minded isn't virtuous. Being open-minded just means you're a pushover. Um, I think a lot of coaches fall into that trap. Like I'm super, I'm not open-minded at all. Close-minded. I have my opinions. I have my beliefs. Um, and it's, highly unlikely that I'm going to change them unless I'm confronted with a, a very convincing argument otherwise on a lot of things. So that my, mean, my biggest yeah. advice to like coaches who are entering this uh, field is don't be a pushover. <laughs> that's it. It's, I mean, that's good advice, like to actually stand your ground and like have some conviction in what you believe in. I mean, yes, I exactly. Exactly. If, if you're willing to change your mind so easily on a topic, or if you're or if you're willing to like change your approach on something just to appease someone else, you probably don't have very strong convictions. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and on, the, on the same on the same breath, if you can't defend what you're doing and you're easily going to fold, then what was the point of you actually doing that? Like you're you're either copying someone else or you haven't done your due diligence to actually understand either what training modality you're doing, like what your philosophy is when it comes to coaching athletes or 
like you said, you're you're going to be a pushover and you're going to get you'll be a doormat in the profession for a while. And I think you're right, too. Like, I feel like we ended up kind of overcorrecting and then trying to get on the same page as what athletic training was doing and what administrators wanted and what sport coaches wanted to do to appease them. And just to like solidify ourselves as a legitimate profession. I mean, it's the same exactly. as us copying what they're doing, like what athletic training's doing and trying to like make it accredited and make everything go to like an entry level masters. It's like, why can't we pave our own path and do it a different way? And in, in the sense of doing that now where we're undervaluing ourselves. Yep. So that's, it's crazy to think that like, I, I mean, you've been, you've been in the profession for a while now, but still like only at you, you've only known like your alma mater, like you've only known UND, like you've, you've gone to play for other organizations and everything. Uh, but the majority of the coaches around you are similar, like Bockle's still there. He's been there for a long time. So how, how have you been able to do like reach out to and talk to other people about different philosophies and, or like, are you kind of just doing your own research and everything on your own and bringing it back and to add it to your own programs? Um, yeah, I think it's just reaching out to people on social media, just messaging people. Like I've become friends with Jake Tura, Austin Yoakum, uh, like Brandon McCarty, if you know, Brandon, Angus Bradley, a bunch of, a bunch of these guys who are like pretty well known, I guess, in like, Instagram strength and conditioning. I've become friends with that. I think it's just because I have a lot of the same personality traits as those guys and I get along with them regardless if we talk about, I really don't even like talking about training to be honest very much. Um, so most of our conversations aren't even about that stuff, but then you just like pick up a, you sort of a sort of adopt um, different aspects of the way they do things uh, training or, or just like lifestyle habits. And you just kind of, yeah, you pick it up, you learn, and just start acting a certain way yeah no that's that's good that i kind of see you're going to gravitate to a lot of those guys so being able to kind of pick up things and i mean i'm the same way too when i talk to even if i talk to coaches or other people too inevitably you get back to training just because both of you guys are probably just as passionate about it but i don't want to talk about that stuff all the time like i don't i don't want that to swallow up my entire life and be everything that I do all the time. It's, it's something I do. It's not me. And I think mm -hmm. that, I think a lot of young coaches, we kind of talked about it before a lot of young coaches when they first get into the profession, like they don't know anything else. And that's probably another reason why we kind of devalue ourselves in the profession too, is because we're willing to like treat this as a 24 hour seven, like one-stop shop. It's like, I'll, I'll do anything for the coaches. I'll, I'll I can grind this out forever and you can't do that forever. And I feel like starting that off, you either get burned out too soon, you get 10 years into the profession and you really resent everybody that kind of made you do that in the beginning, or you become someone that doesn't have a life outside of it. Like those are yeah. the three, the three avenues you can take when it it's comes so to not it. conducive to a healthy lifestyle. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Yeah. And yeah. then it, it's going to leave you disgruntled, underpaid and still coaching with no with no escape plan 10 years into it, yeah. whatever it ends up being. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of people that I still know who are stuck in the mud with that. Yeah. What? Uh, so to prevent yourself from kind of getting in that situation, like, did you ever fall victim to that or were you always? Yes. What would what, you kind of take as an approach? I know you obviously you started the online, so you kind of had like financial means off to the side, like you have your family and everything. But was there either like a person or like a point in time where you caught yourself doing it and made sure that, hey, this is not going to happen? 100%. Me, honestly, meeting Austin and Jake, um, when I first saw so I like interacted with them online for probably, I don't know, six months before I met them. And then I went down to Minneapolis uh, one summer. Was it 2021, maybe? I don't know when it was. Summer of 2020 or 2021. I actually met them in person. And I had started doing the online stuff probably a year or two behind them, like after they did. And so I was following them, but I wasn't putting out my own stuff. And so I saw the type of things that they were saying online and the, like their approach to just training and business. And when I first actually met them in person, it was like a huge eye opener for me. 
Um, Cause I think it was either right before or right after Jake had left Youngstown state. I can't remember exactly um, when it was. And it was, it was before, I think it was before Austin left St. Thomas. And then just talking about them and how they, their approach to so many things opened my eyes about like, being a strength and conditioning coach is so insignificant in the grand scheme of things, both for the university and for my life. Like I have so many other things in my life that are more important than being a strength and conditioning coach. But I was, I was stuck in that, stuck in that like mindset of um, I care about my athletes so much. I want my teams to do so well. I'm trying to get along with all of these coaches that I work with. And it was really, yeah, not conducive to a healthy lifestyle. And I wasn't happy with it. I wasn't making a lot of money. So I was like, I need to put my effort into other things that are going to be uh, worth my time more so. And so that's what I started doing over time. I started to, started to just get better at posting online and de delivering my message in like a more brief, concise way that still gets the point across. Um, when I first started, I was like trying to sound super scientific. I was trying to cite research. No one cares about citing research. I don't know why I try to do that. that was the biggest mistake. I think that's a big mistake. A lot of people would, uh, a lot of people do make when they're posting online is trying to cite research. No one cares. I think you said you actually like sound really dumb and low IQ when you try to cite research. I just think that if, if you're trying to cite research, it just means you have no original thoughts and you're trying to regurgitate what the authors of those research papers already said. Um, yeah, it takes no, no authentic and, original thought to do that but um yeah honestly the the eye-opening moment was meeting austin and jake a few summers ago and spending two days with them and just being around them and like i i, I don't know if they know this right now or not but like at, at that time i looked up to them i thought they were like really uh um, important people to follow and like model after and now i just view them as peers there's peers and friends to me now and, but like, yeah, at the time I like really looked up, there's other people too that I'm not naming that I just can't come to mind, my, come to mind right now. But yeah, there was definitely a time where I uh, realized what I was doing is not the lifestyle I wanted to live. So, yeah. No, it's a, it's a good thing you actually realized that I feel like a lot of people get way too far in their career and it's kind of too late. You're not going to just restart. Like if you've been doing it, if you've been in the profession for so long and you're still making minimum and you're kind of grinding along and like you have no money, you have no time on the outside, like people are discouraged to start something over. And then you become in, you're just going to graduate. You're going to live in that facility forever and never get out of it. So it's good that you were able to like find some people and then kind of use them as like ment mentorship and then grow into that peer level. I mean, it's probably the same way like with Bockle there too, like he was, he was your coach at one point And now you guys are, you guys are peers. You guys coach together day in and day out. Like, as have you seen that relationship grow as well? And like, or like, yeah, do you, do you take a mentorship approach with some of the other assistants or like maybe interns or GAs you guys get? Well, okay. I'll say with, I'll say this with Bockle. So he was my coach, right. When I was a player and then he hired me on as a part-time and then promoted me to full-time and there was definitely a point where like he was the authority figure as far as uh, I kind of looked to him to affirm that whatever I think regarding training is the correct take. And then I started to like shift away from like his philosophy because I was following people like Max Schmarzo. <laughs> or, like, I'm not, I, I don't want to shit on him, but there's a lot of people who have different takes regarding training, like anti-Olympic lifting, velocity based stuff all these kinds of things. And then, but over time, then I looked to look back over to Bacal and it's like, no, he's, he's got it figured out. I don't know why I'm like, not, I wasn't trying to like be contrarian to him, but I like shifted away from like his philosophy. Now just like growing up, maturing, being wiser, gaining more knowledge, being a better thinker. Now I'm like back in alignment with him and so on so many more things. So I thought it doesn't even answer your question, but. It's just something I wanted to say. No, I mean, you had to go. I know what you mean, though. You had to take your own path. And a lot of people, too, in the beginning, like even though you had him and he's he's been doing it for a long time. So. Like you said, hey, I, this, this is what I want to do. I'm not you might not be stuck in your ways, like per se, 
but like for a lack of a better phrase, like he he knows what works, he knows what he wants to do, and he's gonna do it this certain way. And like there's no amount of assistant or GA or intern or athlete that's gonna come in that's gonna sway him differently. He the proof's in the pudding. So yeah. well, like there's a reason he does it a certain way because since like 2004 or whenever he's started working there, like that's been developed a certain way because that's the way it should be, should be developed. So, right. Yeah. But it took you, it took you learning that system and kind of being underneath him when you're not an athlete anymore to finally say, well, let me see what else is out there. And then you see what else is out there and for like it better or worse, you still come back to what he's doing. And then now you start to develop your own philosophy and I think a lot of coaches are apprehensive to do that. And it's it's great on your part to do it because most coaches, whoever their first mentor is or whoever they really gravitate to, either on social media or who was their coach growing up, like they live or die by the way that they, they did it. Or they're contrary to what they did in every sort of the word. Like, And they never really develop their own thing. They might change one exercise because, okay, I never got the deadlift and now I want to add deadlift to a program. But th- th- there's nothing unique about it. It's just copying what you learned from your mentor. And at least you've gone through and developed your own philosophy and continue to kind of do that and present it to other people online and and for the athletes you get to work with. So, yeah. No, that's cool. Um, so what I wanted to ask you a little bit more too, um, kind of touching on the mentorship stuff, being in, you don't actually get to do it maybe formally where you have like interns and GAs. I don't know how you guys run the program, but when it comes to like answering the questions and everything on social media and you putting out the videos, like how active are you engaging with some of those people? Like it's one thing to kind of block them off, but like you understand that like more feedback is good. Maybe it channels and like tailors your content um how do you kind of approach like all that feedback you get the questions and stuff and filter it without getting overwhelmed and like tailor into an audience that you don't really care about i just answer the things that i want to answer (laughs) if someone sends me a question that's not worth answering i'm just not going to answer uh that's really it dude um i try to answer everybody i shouldn't say that i try to answer everybody but like obviously some people ask me questions that are thoughtful and are worth responding to. Um, they're worth responding to in a thoughtful way from coming from me. And there's obviously there's people who question who ask questions like, "What's the best exercise to jump higher?" It's like I'm not going to put any effort into answering that question. Um, but yeah, how do I filter through that and provide value? Um, I just provide, I think I just provide value by like giving my authentic takes and then putting them on, putting them out on social media. And if people like my takes, cool. If not, it doesn't really bother me. You can take it or leave it. I'm not going to try to sit here and debate anybody on it. Even though I sometimes do that in the comments, but not often. Um, yeah, I just try to, I try to deliver my message authentically and I don't try to fluff things up. I try to be, I don't want to be disingenuous about my answers. Um, Yeah, that's really it. No, I I like it. Like I said, man, I think it's, I think it's great that it's simplistic. It's authentic. Just going forward. Like it's the same as someone passing you by on the street that just says something like off the cuff that like, Hey, I don't, I don't even need to acknowledge that. Or if you're having a bad day, maybe that turns into an hour long Twitter war. It's uh, it is what it's whatever you feel like doing with it. But to be able to answer it in your own terms without having to sit there and dive through books and pull research out. I think that's, that's a waste of time. And and it doesn't even for you, it doesn't even occupy space in your time. Like it's not worth the effort to even address those things. So like for, for as much as like, as much as like your following has grown and like how long you've been in the coaching profession, it's a testament that you're able to just filter that and, not even let it interfere with the rest of your life, which I think mo- most of the times that would, that would like just lit take up so much free capital and space in someone's head that they would either tailor all their posts to that, or would just honestly get on rants and arguments that are 
negative to themselves and self-inflicted mm-hmm. now. So that's great, man. Hey, so uh, I know you got to run pretty soon. So like any good uh, training session, we end the show with a finisher. So I got four quarters, four okay. questions and uh, overtime at the end. Okay. So take your time on any of them or you can answer them rapid fire. But you ready? Yeah, I'll try to be fast. All right. You might be the first one then. (laughs) Hey, so first one, biggest influence in strength and conditioning and favorite athlete growing up? Biggest influence, I honestly, has got to be Jake Tura. Uh, Favorite athlete growing up is Kevin Garnett. Okay. Hey, so when you're not training, you're not getting ready for anything, what are some of your hobbies outside of the weight room? Playing basketball, playing pickleball, playing spike ball. Those three. Anything with a ball. Got it. Yeah. Sports. Just sports in general. Hey, if you were not coaching, what do you think you would be doing as a profession? And if you could go pro in any sport outside of football, what sport would that be? Okay. I'd be a police officer or somebody in law enforcement. And if I could go pro in anything other than football, I'd be basketball. Okay. Hey, so setting up an ideal training day for yourself, what is playing on the radio and what is the best hands down post training meal? Do I need to just give you one, one like artist on the radio? No, you can go, you can go either genre, you can go PR song, you can go playlist, whatever. I'll go with like a, a mixed playlist of Jelly Roll, uh, NF, Party, and up church all right so a little bit of everywhere what uh mm-hmm. so after that big training session what's uh what's the best post training meal uh probably chipotle or kidoba we don't have a keto or we don't have a chipotle in grand Fork, so it's kidoba but chipotle would be my prefer my preference damn maybe you franchise one of those up there <laughs> hey so last one i got for you for overtime what is either your favorite under the bar memory or favorite coaching memory of yours so far? I got to say under the bar. I think that like the coolest thing I've ever done was 140 kilo split clean into a split jerk without resetting. That's like my favorite memory. Cause I, I don't think I've done anything cooler than that. I think that's like the most impressive thing I've done. Um, and then what was the other one? It, I was I was gonna say or coaching memory too. Oh, coaching memory. I don't know. I don't really have many coaching memories to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> you just black them out. I don't have one. I don't have one. <laughs> All right, we'll leave it at that. Wait, so did you when you did that one forty like split clean and split jerk? Did you switch legs? It yeah. Was- so I yeah. So I cleaned it in in a split position, and then I split my legs again on the jerk, and oh. I did it. I did it without resetting. So I clean and then immediately went to a jerk. Yeah. I feel like I got a, that's a hernia for me. It's, it's actually like, I made a, I made an Instagram post about it. I think it's like a legitimate exercise that you could train and progress. Like the sense of urgency you need to transition from the receiving position and clean into the jerk is crazy. Like I've never felt that way before with anything. So I'll have to look at that one. You might have to, if no one's done it, you should probably just coin it before. So I actually, I got the idea from Keen O'Brien. Do you follow him? I don't think I do. I think he's either in Scotland or Ireland. Um, he does a lot of crazy, like, barbell tricks, too. Stuff like that. Um, I got related. the idea from him. He posted about it. and I was like, I got to try that. Huh. So, I'll have yeah. to check it out. Maybe we're related yeah. somewhere down the lines. Are you Irish? Yeah, my last name's O'Brien. Oh, O'Brien. Duh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's uh, I'll have to look that one up. I might have to give that one a go. Just got to not do it in the garage. So I'll do it outside somewhere. Is your garage ceiling low? Yeah. Yeah. That's so how like, mine is too. So I have to go outside when I do that. I know. That's, it's a, bu- and my, uh, the driveway is so jacked up from dropping stuff on it and from the previous owner having a semi truck park on the driveway. Mm-hmm. Um, there's nowhere like nice and level to drop anything yeah. without it rolling down the hill. Yep. So it's a, yep, it's yep. a pain, but I'll make do with it for now. But Hey man, I appreciate you coming on the show today. 
Uh, for anybody that's got any more questions for you, want to see like the Haas project, uh, buy any of your programs or or shoot you some questions that you may or may not answer. Uh, where, where can they, where can they get a hold of you? Just search my name, Will Rattel, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter. I just started using Twitter like a couple months ago. I'm not super active on there, but you can find me on there too. But yeah, Instagram luck. would be the easiest, easiest place to find me. Yeah. Good luck on Twitter. That, like I said, that's a screaming match and <laughs> whatever amount of characters. So, uh, you can have as much fun on that as you, as you care to. So, Hey, like I said, I appreciate you coming on, uh, Good luck with the upcoming season, and uh, and we'll keep in touch, man. Thanks, man. That's it for this episode of The Strength Game. Thank you again to this week's guest and to our sponsors. Be sure to connect and keep up with our guests at the links in the description below. Remember to subscribe to us on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast provider to stay up to date on all future episodes. Also, check us out on YouTube and CoachOBrien.com where you can find all the video versions of these episodes, as well as show notes, episode schedule, and much more. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome and appreciated. Thanks again for tuning in, and be sure to join us next week for another great episode of The Strength Game.